Hey, good afternoon. At least it's the afternoon here in the Middle East. It's three o'clock, uh, but I believe it's still the morning in London, where we are in the middle of our European section of our global race around the world today with 50 energy analysts over 25 sessions and 12 hours from Hong Kong to Houston. That's where we started the day this morning, getting a deep dive on all things China. And now we're in Europe. And it's really a pleasure to have join us uh, Amrita Sen, co-founder and director of research at Energy Aspects. Amrita, welcome and Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you, too. It's a real pleasure to come back and join you. Uh, let's kick off with our sort of headline. We're sort of looking at a very sort of deep dive in global oil markets, outlook for prices, uh, uh, and then we we'll bring in our panel. Um, but Amrita, we saw in 2022, amongst the many things, but one was a pretty broad range of $50 swing in oil price and literally nearly a $5 daily volatility. Volatility. I'm wondering from your perspective, what will be the kind of range we could see in 23 and is volatility stuck with us? I think volatility is definitely stuck with us. The range, it could be similar simply because we've started with a very low price, but with China's reopening, which is going to be the number one thing driving oil prices this year, the upside could be quite substantial, just depending on the timing of it, right? Uh, China is still grappling with a lot of COVID cases, which has meant that oil demand is yet to pick up quite substantially. Uh, but we are starting to see some of the green shoots with regards to demand and, you know, the jet numbers are picking up, gasoline is picking up, China's crew, uh, product exports, sorry, are coming off very sharply. So, you know, the swing up, we are expecting Chinese demand to grow by about 900,000 barrels per day year on year. Our contacts in China, at, you know, Chinese refiners are telling us that number could be as much as 2 million barrels per day, right? So depending on the number you choose, you could easily see oil prices well above $100 per barrel, and therefore that range could easily, again, be, like, let's say, $30, $40 this year. And when you think of other, I mean, obviously the, the China piece is kind of the, un, is the I, don't know, I wouldn't call it a, a black swan, but I suppose it is a black swan-esque in the sense of the speed at which they've abandoned COVID, zero COVID policy. I mean, China typically known for being very conservative about decision-making. But other issues that were guiding markets last year, where are we with them? I mean, are, they, are we peak rates, peak inflation? Is that now behind us as a sort of guiding sentiment for the markets? I think it's a great question for the simple reason that's what it, the market is actually assuming right now, that the Fed going forward will actually be lowering interest rates because energy prices have start, have come off quite substantially since the peak. And we have seen some of the CPI prints um, come off slightly. The problem with the uh, with all of this is how does China's reopening play out? Clearly, China's reopening will be very inflationary simply because of the amount of pent up demand. And I will say we shouldn't forget the multiplier effect, right? It's not just China opening up, it's the region. And you're going to see just also flights wise globally, there will be a pickup in demand. And with that, energy prices will go up. But that's one side mm -hmm. of the equation. The other side of the equation, a big chunk of inflation was due to supply supply chain shortages, and that was because of China's zero COVID policy. Now, if factories can restart and people can get back to factories, maybe over time, it won't be immediate, but over several months, those supply chain shortages will come off. Some of the tightness we've seen in the housing market because of equipment shortages and so on could ease up. So it's not a clear cut that just because China's reopening, inflationary pressures are going to be back. But I do think the market shouldn't just discount the fact that just because the CPI has turned, that the, that the Fed is going to stop ra uh, raising rates. That might be the case in the near term. But in the second half of the year, the Fed could face inflationary pressures again, just depending how, depending on how effectively the inflationary pressures of China's reopening plays out versus supply chain shortages easing up. Another big factor that sort of gave upward pressure on oil prices last year was the, the massive hike in gas, natural gas prices. And so the, the, there was the, this crossover to or discounted liquids. Is that now passed? Is that behind us? So 
we have never been big believers of uh, gas to oil switching to the extent of millions of barrels per day for the right. simple reason that we've you know daily data that we've got from europe look the theoretical maximum is a big number um yes it, it's millions potentially uh, up to two million barrels per day but in reality the daily power data very clearly shows that in the power sector there has been very little liquid switching where there has been liquid switching has been in the industry, in, like basically in industries, in petrochemical sector, in uh, refineries. And there you have seen, say, refiners, for instance, switch to LPG, naphtha, in some cases, gas oil. That is still continuing because for us to switch back to uh, gas, gas prices need to be 63 euros per megawatt hours. Um, for the switch away from gas oil and as low as 43 euros per megawatt hours to switch back out of LPG. So there is this big misnomer right now because gas prices have fallen that, oh, we've finished oil to, oh, sorry, gas to liquid switching and we've switched back. Gas prices will need to fall a lot more. And our gas team don't believe that gas prices should fall below 70 euros uh, despite the warm winter because at that price, you are going to get quite a bit of demand coming back. And yes, while storage is better right now, it still is a problem for next winter without uh, Russian gas this year. So, um, and where you also I have that issue of the China piece coming back into play as well. Exactly. With the LNG markets. Yeah, and we are just about to raise our LNG forecast for China, which again, good luck Europe getting these cargoes once China is back up and running and, you know, not reselling as many of their cargoes. So I think, look, yes, the warm winter has helped both gas and also keeping the pressure on oil markets. We have lost between four to 500,000 barrels per day of oil demand, would, which would have naturally occurred at this time of the year, heating demand that would have kicked in and that hasn't. So that helps rebuild inventory somewhat, but we haven't really gotten away from the gas to liquid switching because you know gas prices aren't 30 euros it's still 70. And where do you think just on that point China LNG uh, re recovery this year what what are what is your numbers looking like? Well we basically think uh, we are going to see China so China's obviously termed up quite a lot more LNG than they require and they've been reselling that in the market so we think that volume of reselling is going to be lower. Um, we already had factored in Chinese demand to be higher year on year uh, by about 10 to 15 percent and that number is now going to be quite substantially higher um, of course on a percentage basis given uh, last year was quite low uh, but the biggest impact on the market is last going year was to be about 60 million tons exactly exactly and I think it is going to be anywhere between 10 to 15 million tons higher this year if not probably 20 million tons higher right I think that's oh. kind of where we end and I, and I should say probably not this year I should say over this year and next year because but certainly into next winter right exactly so that's why I'm including a longer time period because it's unfair to just talk about Chinese reopening in 2023 it is going to be an 18 month cycle so it's over that period which would put a big, big pressure squeeze back into Europe uh, as they try to rebuild inventories for the mm -hmm. second winter. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing for oil and gas, by the way, that Europe has gotten lucky with the weather and with China being out of the market. Now that China's back, it's going to be game on and let's see who wins these cargoes effectively. It's hard to see where that doesn't have a big impact on inflation as we go into the second mm -hmm. half of the year. Uh, and this sort of sense that uh, we've already reached peak rates uh, might be a bit uh, premature. I wanted to talk a little bit about geopolitics. Of course, we've had the price cap. Is the price cap geopolitics? It is, isn't it? Energy and geopolitics. And we have the, the came in the, the price cap uh, and the um, uh, uh, embargo on Russian marine bound uh, oil. And now we've got products coming in in February. Your thoughts on the first month of the of the price cap and the embargo? Uh, and, and with the products embargo coming, what impact are they likely to have? So for us, we don't think the crude embargo actually is as material as the products embargo because the crude embargo, the crude is going to reshuffle east. And we are seeing that India is buying more. China, 
not as much as some people expected, but definitely buying a little bit more, right? Um, we've seen about a 300,000 barrels per day drop in crude exports versus November. Uh, December was a bigger drop. It's picked up a little bit in January, but still it, it is kind of lower uh, a little bit. And I think that's basically the amount that Russia is struggling to place anywhere. Maybe that's what leads to the in, the first round of shut-ins. Let's call it two to 300,000 barrels per day, which is not enormous, but definitely something. The products embargo is a tricky one because Russia has really struggled to place its diesel anywhere else other than uh, Europe. And I think that's where you are going to see the big, big impact on the upstream because we are anticipating Russia finding homes for about a third of its diesel, but two thirds will have to shut in because, you know, unlike crude, in crude, you could see that Russia immediately went east from April, May of last year. And you could see India taking more volumes, China gradually taking more volumes in diesel. They just haven't been able to do that. Latin America, in theory, would be a place to put those diesel. But there's a lot of pressure from America to not change or not take Russian volumes because of obviously the geopolitics, as you mentioned. So if that's the case, and if Russia has to basically shut in, two thirds of its 750,000 barrels per day of diesel it exports, that means run cuts of about one and a half million barrels per day. And we barely have enough ships to move the crude around now to the east. We're definitely not gonna have enough crude to put another one and a half million barrels per day of crude, right? So that's why we are expecting a million barrels per day of shut-ins in Russian upstream once the product embargo kicks in. Do you think there is enough? I mean, there's a lot of capacity of refining coming into Asia. We've seen in the, here in the Gulf recently uh, new refineries opening uh, and the Kuwait refinery just committing most of its output to go to Europe. Do you think we have the, the, the products capacity in the east of Suez to satisfy Europe to solve this problem? On paper, yes, and especially like you say, with the new Middle Eastern refineries, the, and they are very, very heavy on distillates. So the yields are very jet and diesel heavy. So it does help. In the second half, we do think the diesel market won't face as steep a crunch as they initially when the embargo kicks in. Um, having said that, I think so much will depend on two things. One, China, even though China is commissioning two new refineries as well, their product export quotas are already lower. Yes, they are higher year on year, but they are lower quarter on quarter. And we do believe, and from what we are hearing as well, China is going back to not really just throwing out product exports, rather controlling it to an extent for their environmental goals, right? They had included refining in their 2025 energy intensity reduction target, and that's back on the agenda. So regardless of how much new capacity China builds, if they are throttling back product exports, the Eastern markets are going to be really tight, in which case the new Middle Eastern capacity, the barrels coming out of there will have to swing East. That will create pressure on the West, so that's something to watch out for. The other factor is going to be feedstock. Russia is really the only country that exports VGO or just general feedstock, right? And we have Jazan in Saudi Arabia that was spewing out a lot of feedstock materials, straight from fuel oil. Now with the hydro treater uh, coming back or coming online, that's going to stop as well. So if you don't have enough intermediaries, we are going to have problems producing enough clean products this might really hit gasoline in the summer, especially if you think that, you know, China's reopening is going to be bullish gasoline in that country, right? So less of a diesel story potentially, but the gasoline market is the one I'd say to watch out for in the summer, especially as jet also now needs the yield from refiners because jet demand is also picking up. How about crude, the, the second year now going uh, with Russian crude going into Asia, bedding into India substantially and into China. Does this have any tension potentially within OPEC plus as this Russian crude oil does become a more permanent feature uh, competing for market share in Asia? No, look, because I think OPEC plus are very aware of this trade flow change. OPEC plus, at least the key countries have also maintained their market share. You haven't really seen a big drop off. Some countries like Iraq has faced some pressures from Asia. But at the same time, we are seeing more Middle Eastern volumes also move to Europe. 
like we are seeing more Murban and more um, some of the lighter grades from the Middle East move to Europe. So it has been a trade flow reshuffle. Yes, some grades, again, like the kind of more heavier crudes that Iraq produces, we've had we've seen them discount a lot more because Europe is unable to process those. Uh, but no, I don't see this being a huge issue that derails OPEC plus. The relationships are very, very strong. Um, and, you know, again, in terms of overall, Russia requires OPEC plus right now more than ever before. And will OPEC plus need to revisit their decision, do you think, this year? The, the last decision was to cut quotas by 2 million barrels a day. Technically, a million barrels came off the market. Will they need to revisit that decision with the reopening of China? I think that's going to be the million dollar question. Our balances assume OPEC plus will have to increase production in the second half of the year. We've already accounted for that in our balances, uh, but I do think OPEC plus will want to really see evidence of stock draws returning, of the China reopening before they add barrels. Um, but yes, I do think, again, you know, we don't even need to lose Russian barrels. Russia can be unchanged year on year. But if China is or were to bring back 2 million barrels per day, let's just as an example, uh, assume that that would require more OPEC barrels. Just finally, I mean, they, we saw traders and fund managers leave the crude oil markets in the second half of last year. A lot of traders made enough money in the first half, but generally the, the, the volatility drove a lot of people away. Uh, what's your outlook on them returning, particularly the fund managers into 23 and that being that capital being another elevation for prices? Right now, um, as I said, Sean, I mean, since last year, that trend has continued. Uh, net length in both Brent and WTI, if I could show you a chart, I would. It's shocking how low it is. Managed money, which is essentially the fund managers, their uh, long positions or net long positions are pretty much at the 2020 low. So we are basically saying from their point of view, pricing in COVID. Uh, which baffles me. I don't necessarily understand that. If you look at any other asset class, everything has gone up with China's reopening. Somebody forgot to tr tell crude traders that. So I think people are still sitting on the sidelines, uh, partly because it's seasonal. You don't want to necessarily go along with refinery maintenance coming up. The physical looks sloppy because we have built over the last two months. So I think the physical will have to lead. Then these money managers will come back. Um, but yes, when it does, I do think there's quite a lot of shorts in the market as well. And then you're going to get that cov like the short covering rally. But that probably may not happen till April, right? Like you need to get through turnarounds as well. Or maybe uh, IP week is late this year in London. Maybe kind of it's, it's late uh, February. So maybe you get that from March onwards. And just finally, we saw a Brent average $9,900 a barrel in 2022. What's your call for 2023? We believe with the China reopening, we will average above $100, so closer to 110 For the year? For the year, yes. Wow, that's a big one. Amrita Sen, thank you so much. Thank Great you. to have you on the, the with us on the UAE Energy Forum as we go around the world gathering all these insights. Real pleasure. Of course, Amrita Sen, co-founder and director of research at Energy Aspects and Energy Aspects obviously going from strength to strength. And it's really great to have you with us today. Thank Bye. you very much.